this is MSCI Perspectives, your source for insights for global investors and access to research and expertise from across the investment industry. I'm your host, Adam Bass, and today is April 29th, 2021. Today, we welcome back two old friends of the pod, Andy Sparks, MSCI's Head of Portfolio Management Research, and Demetrius Mellis, MSCI's Head of Core Equity Research. Demetrius, you may recall, joined us in the very early days of the pandemic. The pandemic had shut down his local pub. The old fighting cocks which had survived for 1,200 years, but was closed by the UK government, possibly for good, he thought. Well, it took more than a year, but when we spoke with Demetrius earlier this week, he had some good news. There are uh, some tentative signs here in the UK that uh, we are returning to normal. The MSCI offices in London has reopened from April 12th. Uh, Some of the shops here in the UK are open, and importantly, pubs in general, and my local pub here in St. Albans uh, has reopened. So I have been able to go back and enjoy a pint uh, in the sunshine a week ago. I share this story not only to let you know the latest about England's oldest pub, but because it relates directly to our topic today, inflation. Despite concerns throughout 2020 that large stimulus packages and central bank actions around the world would cause inflation to spike, it has been a while since it proved a true concern. Now, as vaccines flow, restrictions lift, and economies reemerge from their long slumber, some feel this time it might be different. There is obviously pent-up demand as all of us uh, have been locked inside for most of the last year. And... You know, as economies reopen, I think uh, the consumer uh, will take uh, advantage of the new opportunities uh, to spend. Companies will uh, take advantage of the better environment to invest. So we're likely to see better economic growth. And this is likely to lead to somewhat higher inflation in the coming several quarters. So that's really the the concern uh, in markets at the moment, given uh, this uh, extremely strong uh, stimulus that we've had in the economy. And as we reopen with vaccines uh, and economic activity returns back to normal, could prices rise and could we see inflation going up? Andy continued the thought. We've had major pieces of legislation um, driving more fiscal stimulus. This goes back to the Trump administration. There was a major piece of legislation passed then adding significant new fiscal stimulus. Now, the Biden administration had its fiscal stimulus bill, which passed Congress. And now we're working on a third piece of legislation for infrastructure. So this all adds up to very, very significant fiscal stimulus at the same time that we've had major monetary policy aggressiveness. and. At exactly the same time that the rate of vaccination has been such that a fairly large part of the population in the United States and in other developed market countries has become vaccinated and the lockdowns are easing. And even in the absence of the fiscal policy and the monetary policy, just the the good news generally on the health front um, probably would have led to a big burst in economic activity and good news on the economy. And on top of that, you put in the stimulus and the monetary policy, and we are in uncharted waters. And um, the question is, is uh, whether that could lead to a big um, burst of inflation that's not just temporary, but could persist. That's one of the core issues in the bond market right now. We dug into this a little bit more with Andy, specifically following up on research he and his team had published last month. In late March, about a month ago, as we record this, you wrote, in summary, if inflation picks up to levels suggested by market-implied pricing, cash investments or short maturity investments may experience some of their worst inflation-adjusted returns of the past two decades. As we speak today, what are you seeing in the markets when it comes to expectations about inflation? It's very similar to what we about um, a few weeks ago. I think there is a lot of concern about inflation there. And so as reflected in market implied pricing, markets are expecting a short burst of inflation in coming months, followed by a slowly moderating level of inflation spanning many years. 
And so long run inflation expectations are very close to the Fed's 2% target. This is just another way of saying that markets have confidence in the Fed and the Fed's ability to control inflation. But the reality is, is that inflation expectations have risen, and there are definitely um, quite a few market participants who think that the uh, the market may be understating inflation um, going forward. And there are definitely some beneficiaries of inflation, but on the other side, they're also losers from inflation. And specifically, investors in bonds receiving a steady flow of fixed coupons on their fixed income investments. Those coupons and the principal received on their bond investments will purchase fewer goods and services in the future in the presence of inflation. So this is the reason why the the voices of the so-called bond market vigilantes are becoming louder now as they call out rising inflation risk. So the savers and the bondholders um, could be uh, significant losers of, of future inflation. That begs the question about why anyone would invest in bonds right now. I would say that investments in bonds can be considered as insurance against equity market volatility and excessive equity valuations. Those negative on the bond market might say that this is very expensive insurance. Supporters, on the other hand, may argue that the sell-off in the bond market that we've seen since last November has improved valuations and made the sector um, much more attractive. Now that we've heard the news from Bond City, let's head over to Equity Heights. When we take a look at global equity markets, um, year to date, for example, we've seen strong overall performance, double-digit returns in many markets. And then When you go under the surface, we've seen a substantial rotation within equity markets into the more cyclical sectors, factors, and strategies. So, for example, we've seen value strategies outperform growth in the last few months. We've seen uh, small capitalization uh, companies outperform large cap stocks. And generally, we've seen cyclicals outperform defensives. And we've seen that at the industry level as well. If you look at uh, how different industries in global equities have performed this year, for example, or the last six months, you'll notice that um, materials, industrials, financials, and energy have done well, have outperformed the market, while on the other hand, what we would call defensive industries, utilities, healthcare, consumer staples, those have lagged behind, still delivering positive returns, but uh, certainly um, underperforming compared to these other sectors that I mentioned. There's one notable exception, um, from a regional perspective, from a country perspective, um, as the cycle picks up, normally you would expect emerging markets to power ahead and outperform developed markets, but we haven't seen that. And I think you know there's a combination of uh, reasons why this is the case. Clearly, we have lagging uh, COVID effects in, in emerging markets. They are now experiencing a second wave of infections, while In some of the developed markets, especially the U.S., the U.K., for example, we seem to be coming out of uh, of this second wave. And also the the strength in the U.S. dollar is is another headwind for emerging markets. But with the exception of this uh, EM versus DM relationship, which is not playing out in the way that you would expect it at this point in the cycle, I think there's definitely a lot of evidence that... uh, Inflation, higher inflation expectations are being reflected in equity markets, and we've seen a substantial rotation into cyclical uh, sectors uh, and factors as well. We've done several blogs looking at inflation and equities. There, there are different inflation scenarios that could come to pass. A scenario that would be bad generally for the capital markets is, is a real stagflation environment where you have low or even negative economic growth and high inflation. And we had some experience with that in the late 70s and early 80s in the United States. So now there are others, other more benign types of inflation that um, may be less, uh, less harmful to equities. Remember that reference to the 70s and 80s. We'll get back there. But for now, let's keep going with this idea about different scenarios. Broadly speaking, I think we can uh, see four scenarios for inflation. Going forward, the most likely scenario is moderate inflation. 
Um, we may see higher inflation. Uh, and then there are two more extreme scenarios. On one hand, on one extreme, you have stagflation, very high inflation, uh, while growth is uh, muted or even negative, and then deflation. So moderate inflation in the rate of, let's say, 2 to 3% may actually be a very positive sign that the global economy is growing again and that economic activity is becoming more normalized after the pandemic. So I think government bond markets, as uh, Andy mentioned in his comments, are generally pricing in this scenario for the medium and long term, and as a result, may be little affected by it. And this could also, you know, moderate inflation in the range of 2 to 3 percent would also be a very benign background for equity markets in general. However, if we see inflation overshooting this range, uh, I think both equities and fixed income uh, could potentially suffer. And I guess you know, going beyond that, the worst scenario for equity markets, of course, would be deflation uh, um, uh, or stagflation, those other two extremes that we mentioned. Uh, however, given uh, current condition, I think ca- current conditions, I think deflation and stagflation, we can probably discount them as theoretically possible, but hopefully unlikely to play out uh, in the near future. One point to remember as investors consider these different scenarios is how to interpret and think about acting on growth and inflation numbers. For one thing, as Andy pointed out, we get inflation monthly, we get GDP quarterly. So it may be wise to take a breath or two before reacting. The market's going to be, of course, very focused on um, economic reports. And the first few reads in, in coming months are going to be a little, potentially a little deceptive because prices were at relatively low levels at a year ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic. It is true that um, the reported economic numbers actually lag markets and markets already discount these so-called base effects. We call them base effects. So, for example, of course, we had the collapse in economic activity and, and prices fell a year ago when the pandemic hit. So as a result, this will lead to higher reported defl- inflation in the coming months because the comparison is with uh, the prices a year ago. And, and we will observe similar base effects in terms of economic growth. We had the you know, depressed economic activity a year ago, so it's not going to be surprising to investors and market participants when we see some strong year-on-year uh, growth numbers reported uh, you know, in the next, next few months. Both Demetrius and Andy were very clear, however. There's more to this than the year-over-year. Year. It's not just the turning of the cycle and economic activity picking up after a more depressed period. Investors are interested in the add-on effect of the stimulus, or rather, the level of the stimulus. Much of the debate in financial markets uh, is focusing on uh, uh, the question of, uh, you know, to what extent the stimulus has been the right size. Uh, have governments uh, done enough or have they possibly done too much? And will this feed into higher prices and higher inflation going forward? The right role of government, both on the fiscal and monetary policy side, that's not a question we're going to be able to answer here. To be honest, even time may not settle this debate. But as we search for answers about the right path and what investors might expect from a period of sustained, even moderate inflation, it can be helpful to look back at what's come before. And while... You know, from an inflation perspective, you could argue the past 20 years has been almost um, a Goldilocks scenario. Inflation has been relatively stable. There was a time not too long ago when inflation was anything but stable. And investors' portfolios, well, they were looking anything but groovy. Yeah, the 70s and 80s is is the nightmare in the minds of current bond market investors. We had a situation where the U.S. economy experienced exceptionally high and variable inflation, which at times touched over 10%. After inflation, returns were negative for extended periods of time. We had a situation where oil and food shocks were accompanied by very accommodative monetary policy. And it was really not until Paul Volcker became chairman of the Fed in 1979 that the Fed adopted a policy to really rein in inflation. And they did this by significantly tightening monetary policy. The result was a dramatic increase in short-term interest rates, 
which coincided with a, a sharp increase in the employment rate. So by the mid-1980s, rates were falling, the economy was rebounding, but um, the medicine the economy took to get to that point, some, some would argue, was, was very severe and too much. Um, but in general, the bond markets greeted that, uh, that tightening. Uh, ultimately, they, they greeted it very warmly. And then, you know, moving forward, late 80s, early 90s, uh, and throughout the 90s, we had other structural uh, trends such as globalization, deregulation that created benign market conditions. So we enjoyed a very long bull market, actually, in, uh, from the mid 80s all the way to the early 2000s in both equities and, and fixed income, both, uh, you know, global equity markets and, and fixed income markets performed quite well. And during these three decades, uh, you know, the 90s and 2000s, 2010s, when you had a crisis, uh, equities would suffer, but then central banks would step in, cut interest rates, and, and bonds would, uh, would perform well. So equities and bonds had this negative correlation, and therefore they provided a good hedge for each other. And as a result, strategies such as 60-40 in long-only portfolios or, or risk parity, for example, in, in long-short portfolios provided effective diversification. You know, bonds and equities were a good hedge for each other. Now, if we see inflation rising in the future, the question is, will this relationship persist or will equities and bonds start to move in tandem? In moderate inflation, I think it's likely that the, the negative correlation could persist, but in higher inflation uh, environments, uh, it could break down. And we may see some of these traditional strategies that have provided diversification, such as 640, actually perform less well in a high inflation environment. And as we, as investors consider going forward, I think a, a very important question is, can history repeat itself? That's what people are trying to figure out. We had a situation where in the early phases of the pandemic, we had um, significant rallies in U.S. Treasuries, but the equity market sold off. So there was that insurance value of bonds, and particularly U.S. Treasuries. And then we had uh, another phase where we had um, generally, in more recently, I should say, we've had a situation where we've had um, – generally very good news on the um, economic front and equities have rallied um, very significantly um, at the same time that bonds have sold off. And so that's a little bit of the unwind of the, the insurance um, value of bonds. It wasn't needed, but again, you had that negative correlation. But bonds are oftentimes thought by asset allocators to be uh, a defensive play and the anchor in a, in a portfolio, when that portfolio and when the markets, particularly the equity markets, are, are going through stormy waters. I, I would say the last year, we've also seen that uh, bonds do provide, uh, to some extent, a hedge for equities. But, you know, the question is looking forward, and if we see inflation overshooting, uh, will that relationship uh, persist or will it change? And I think there is a chance that it, it might change. There are other factors at play here as well differences between the 70s and today, besides polyester leisure suits, that is. Sorry, couldn't resist getting in one more. I do think the Fed has tried very hard to learn lessons from the experience of the 70s and 80s. That includes effective communication and transparency of policy and very strict adher adherence to its, its dual mandate of maximum employment and stable prices. And so that's the hallmark of the modern modern Fed. So the Fed back in, particularly in the 70s, it was accused at times of not being, having enough independence from, um, from policymakers. Critics of the Fed would say that they were too accommodating to the um, political powers um, at that time. There was no inflation target up until um, Chairman Bernanke's um, reign at the Fed. He introduced um, inflation targets in 2012, um, but the Fed, even before that, had been acting, I, I'd say, as if there were some, some numerical inflation targets. And there were also meetings during the summer, um, during the um, what's known as the Jackson Hole meetings, um, where they, they changed some of their policy, 
And again, but in a very transparent way. And so, among other things, they said that that 2% inflation target should not be viewed as a cap, but as an average. And the Fed also clearly said that they're no longer going to be involved in preemptive changes in policy in anticipation or based on a forecast of what might happen. Instead, they're going to be very outcome-oriented. And more recently, as the Fed has uh, been discussing its uh, its near-term outlook and its, its policy responses, um, they've gone out of their way to say that they, they aren't changing their, their um, asset purchase program or their uh, rates program, the Fed funds rate in this case. But, but all the same, could, could that change in policy be fueling some of, some of the fear that they're going to wait too long, let's say, to react and almost a self-fulfilling prophecy from the markets? Absolutely. That is, that is a concern that um, – you know, the Fed, you know, there's a concern that the Fed is would prefer to be late rather than early. And um, the concern is that they may be too late. And a real problem with inflation is when it begins seeping its way into expectations. And so when businesses begin entering into contracts with suppliers or with employees, Maybe they'll have a one-year contract or a two-year contract. And in those contracts, the, the terms may be fixed over the term of that contract. And so if companies and individuals begin to think that inflation is going to rise, they will write into these contracts changes in fees, changes in prices, changes in wages based on that anticipation and once that happens, it could begin to affect current inflation, actual inflation. So, so what's an investor to do? What are the options? You need to look at it in a broader context from the context of a multi-asset class portfolio. And I would also say within the bond market, I think there are um, a lot of interesting relative value plays, potential plays. It could be the slope at the curve. Should you buy the long end and short the short end? Should you be overweighted in emerging markets? Private debt is uh, an increasingly interesting asset class that I think investors are looking at. Now, under a higher inflation scenario, uh, it's possible that equities and nominal bonds uh, may suffer declines uh, based on historical uh, analysis. In this type of environment, other asset classes such as index-linked bonds and even commodities could provide better hedging opportunities. Now, under a higher inflation scenario, uh, it's possible that equities and nominal bonds uh, may suffer declines uh, based on historical uh, analysis. In this type of environment, other asset classes such as index-linked bonds and even commodities could provide better hedging opportunities. If we take a step back and uh, look at what's been happening recently, of course, we've seen uh, we're still in the early stages of adoption, but digital assets are gaining uh, you know, more acceptance gradually. Mainly cryptocurrencies, they could over time uh, uh, facilitate transactions, help investors manage inflation, and even uh, help preserve wealth over time. But as I said, We're still in the early stages. Uh, uh, We need to see uh, a lot more development and transparency into how these digital assets are priced, how they're traded. Uh, I I personally find it very exciting, and and we're already starting to do some research to understand that space and support some of our clients. We're trying to answer questions like, uh, well, what what is the volatility of these assets compared to more established financial assets? Uh, What is their correlation with other asset classes? Can they help? help to, to hedge uh, certain risks such as inflation? Could, could they play a role similar to, to gold, for example, in the future in terms of uh, helping to hedge inflation? So there's a whole host of questions and we're just starting to get to grips of, with those questions, but it's, a, it's certainly a very exciting technological innovation that uh, hopefully will open up new avenues for investors. What came through loud and clear in our discussions is that fixed income and equity markets seem to be saying inflation is coming, though how steep and how long is still up for debate. Now, if these indicators are correct, there are many people working in the industry today for whom sustained inflation is merely historical, theoretical even. 
Though a fund manager, let's say, they, they might have decades of experience. Well, it's been decades since this has happened. I asked Demetrius and Andy what they would say to such a fund manager. So look, I can, I can certainly talk about my own personal experience. I started working in financial markets in the late 90s. And uh, throughout my career, I, I saw three major crises, the technology crisis of uh, 2000, the financial crisis in 2008, and of course, the pandemic that we had in 2020, and, and we're still uh, going through it as we speak. So this experience has taught me that although there are similarities Every market crisis that I uh, went through as a, as, a, as a professional is different. Therefore, I think all of us, we should study and try to understand the history of financial markets during periods of stress, during periods of crisis. But more importantly, I think we should always look into the future and understand the new challenges that we're facing. I think looking at the U.S. itself, um, going back to the 70s and 80s and asking the question of how did inflation reach those very high levels and how was it ultimately reined in? I think for those younger fund managers that weren't alive in those days and maybe weren't too aware of what was going on, I think it would definitely be worth their while to, um, to, to look at some of that history. It's, it's not exactly ancient history yet. That's all for this week. A big thank you from co-producer Joe Colavecchio and me to Andy and Demetrius, and, of course, to all of you for listening. For more insights into the effects of inflation on portfolios, visit MSCI.com. We also invite you to check out our sister podcast, ESG Now. We'll be back with a new episode on May 13th. Until then, I'm your host, Adam Bass, and this is MSCI Perspectives. Stay safe, everyone.